All right, let's take a look at some final wave topics in preparation for the final exam. Uh, one of the topics you should know about is diffraction. Diffraction is the bending of a wave around a barrier. And you're responsible for a few things about diffraction. Uh, let's grab our trusty red pen. Uh, the first would be single barrier diffraction. If you had, this is like a top view, like a little sandbar here, and you had a wave, again, a top view of a straight front wave coming by, uh, this part of the wave would reflect off. Again, the wave is coming in this way, and this wave, as it passes, would bend around the barrier, so you would get diffraction like this. So you would get wave back where you wouldn't think you normally would have it. If this were particles, the particles would travel by and you would not get any activity back here, but waves bend around barriers. And if we have a classic double barrier, again, here comes our square front wave. And I'm drawing with the mouse. The general idea, even though that gap seems a little wide up there, the general idea is the wavelength shouldn't be changing here, but the wave should be bending. So here we get the wave going through this small opening and then you get semicircular wave fronts here. If we get a half, a quarter circle here, we're gonna have a semicircle here. So you're gonna have the bending of a wave around a barrier. Again, the wavelength shouldn't be changing, but you should be getting semicircular wave fronts. And what affects the amount of diffraction? Like sometimes you get a lot of bend, sometimes you get a little bit of bend. The amount of the bend depends upon the wavelength. So that would be how far it is between, let's say, crests and the opening size. The opening size would be this size right here. And important point, you get the maximum diffraction when the wavelength is about equal to the opening size. Uh, electromagnetic waves, this chart is in your New York State reference table and it lists types of electromagnetic radiation by both frequency, which gets bigger going to the left, and wavelength, which gets bigger going to the right, which makes sense because as wavelength gets smaller, frequency should get bigger, right? They're inverses of each other. If you look down here at this all-important wave equation, since the speed of light in a vacuum, C, is a constant, as one of these terms, in this case wavelength, goes up, the other must go down, which would be, in this case, frequency. Uh, they're all, I would look things up by frequency, always look up by frequency. So um, each of these types, if you have a frequency of 10 to the 18, then you would be talking an X-ray. And I guess it could also be a gamma ray, and it could also be ultraviolet. It depends where it fell. It is possible to be two things at once. Um, probably most importantly is this little sliver right in here, which when broken out down below, shows you all of the frequencies, notice these are frequencies measured in hertz, uh, of visible light, um, classified by color. So here, any frequency between these two values would be red. Remember, we never say reddish orange or orangish red or greenish blue. We always just state the color that falls, uh, if it falls in this range, we would say green no matter how close to the borders we are. Everything on this chart travels at three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. So it's not that gamma rays, even though they sound uh, really powerful and they do carry a lot of energy, they are not any faster than, um, let's say, FM radio waves. All, everything on this chart travels at three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Uh, when it comes to visible light, it is helpful to know that violet, uh, which is the high frequency stuff, comes with a small wavelength, and re relatively small. And red, uh, which is the long wavelength stuff, has a lower frequency. So it's not a surprise here that when one is big, the other is small, because again, these two are inverse of each other. As one goes up, the other goes down, because the speed of light is a constant. However, this stuff is all on your reference table, but it's helpful to remember that the high frequency stuff is violet and the low frequency stuff is red. All right, the most important topic in this second waves review is, of course, refraction. Now, refraction occurs when waves bend um, because they go from one medium to another at an angle. Now, the reason for the bend, of course, is a change in speed. And you might be thinking, Mr. Poyer, I thought that waves travel at a constant speed three times 10 to the 8 meters per second. No, that's only in a vacuum. When a wave enters any other medium with an index of refraction other than one, uh, light will slow down. So as the end value gets bigger, meaning the material is more optically dense, the speed of light in that medium will go down. 
Remember, C is a number that we never solve for. It is the speed of light in a vacuum. It is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So you simply look up the index of refraction on the reference table. Remember, index of refraction does not have um, a unit of measure. It's just a number. It's a ratio. Um, and V in the medium is the speed in the given medium. Now, when it comes to which way light will bend, it's very helpful uh, to have a little rhyme so that we can solve problems qualitatively rather than quantitatively. So here we have a light ray traveling in an index refraction of one, which according to your reference table is either a vacuum or air, and it's heading into 1.47. Uh, so the index refraction is going up. So in terms of our rhyme that we use this year, less to more bends toward, this is indeed less to more. But bends toward what? Well, hopefully you remember that it bends toward the all-important normal, because we would never do a reflection or refraction problem without drawing the normal. Now, the normal is perpendicular to the surface. The surface is the big black line here, the vertical line. Perpendicular to the surface where the ray strikes it. So here's where the ray is striking, right here. So we would draw our normal with a protractor and a ruler, never freehand it like I'm doing it. And the angles that we would measure are always from the normal. So this would be your theta 1, known as your angle of incidence. And, um, and the theta 2 would be measured from the normal. But the question is, which of these three rays could it be? Well, it's certainly not going to be the center ray, because that would indicate that the ray doesn't bend at all. And whenever you have a change in index of refraction, in this case from 1 to 1.47, you're going to get a bend. So will it be the top ray or the bottom ray? Well, our rhyme, less to more, says it bends toward. It bends toward the normal. So the proper theta 2, which is known as the angle of refraction, would be right there, measured between the normal and the ray. So how do we calculate refraction? Because that was a qualitative approach. Well, this is the other biggie in this unit, other than n equals c over v, Snell's law. n1, sine of the angle of incidence equals N2 sine of the angle of refraction, which is theta 2. Please make sure that your calculator is in degree mode, not radian mode, uh, before working Snell's law problems. And of course, only one of these can be uh, an unknown. You just have to uh, attack the problem as you see it. We'll get to an example in a bit. Uh, first, let's talk about reflection. <clears throat> reflection is perhaps the easiest topic in this unit. The law of reflection, which is actually on the New York State reference table, says theta i equals theta r. Uh, the only real um, caveat here is that you have to measure from the normal. So if you were asked what the angle of incidence or the angle of reflection is in this problem up above, you might be tempted to measure this angle because it's the only one that we can see. However, we never measure from the ray to the surface. We always measure from the ray to the normal. So your theta i uh, would be right there measured between the ray and the normal. Now, since the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, the reflected ray would go across the normal and it would bounce off of the mirror. It would not go down into the uh, new material. And this would be your theta r. And I didn't use a protractor here and those don't exactly look equal, but this angle right here is supposed to be equal to that angle in there. All right, let's take a look at a uh, meaningful example. Uh, here we have a ray coming in in water, not air. You always have to pay attention, and it's heading into zircon. So if you look up the indices of refraction on your reference table, you will see that the top one is a lower number than the bottom one, which means we are going to be going less to more. Uh, there's a couple of calculations to do here and a little bit of drawing. Um, of course, I already have the ray drawn, but that's what you're going to do down in part B. Um, I'm going to put this, um, why don't you put the video on pause and go ahead and try to work this example out as best you can. Hopefully you have a ruler and a protractor. And uh, when you get done, unpause the video and we'll go over the solution. All right. Calculate the speed of light in zircon. Well, that would be using our friend n equals c over v. Um, but we want to solve for the V, which is in the denominator here, which when you want to solve for the thing in the denominator, you simply swap these two. So V is going to be the index, or sorry, the speed of light in a vacuum over the index of refraction for the material. 
So this would be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which I'm just going to put as C again. You can put that in there if you want to. And you need to look up the index of refraction for zircon, which is 1.92. And it doesn't have units on it. It's just 1.92. That leaves us with a speed of 1.56. Again, sorry for the sloppy pemichip. I'm writing with mouse. 1.56 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Remember, in the wave unit, when you're dealing with visible light, uh, and nobody ever said this is visible light, I don't think, uh, you're going to get times 10 to the 8 always for the, for the speed, and you're going to get 10 to the 14 hertz uh, for, um, for the frequency. Uh, didn't ask us for frequency here, but those are some things you can remember. Draw the ray going from water to zircon with an angle of incidence of 30 degrees. That does not mean from the surface. That means from the normal. So first, you would want to draw a normal and then put your protractor down and measure 30 degrees from the normal. And draw your ray. I mean, you'd want to put your protractor down like this. Remember, right? Because you want to put zero on the normal. And then you would measure that. Uh, 30 degrees out. Calculate the angle of refraction. Well, that's going to be a Snell's law calculation. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, theta 2 is going to be the unknown. So what would we do? We would do 1.33, which is N1, uh, times the sine of theta 1. And theta 1 is a given. So that's the sine of 30 degrees equals N2, which is... Uh, zircon, which is 1.92 off the reference table, times the sine of theta 2. Now, how do we solve for the sine of theta 2? Or more importantly, theta 2? Well, you would divide by 1.92, first of all, and you would have 1.33 sine of 30 over 1.92. But then remember, in trig, when you want the angle back, you have to hit the inverse sine. So it's going to be the inverse sine of 1.33 times the sine of 30 divided by 1.92. When you work all that out, you should get a theta 2 of, I get 20.3 degrees. Draw the refracted ray. Well, we need the rest of our normal here because we always draw from the normal. And it has to cross the normal. Remember, every reflected and refracted ray must cross the normal. So we're going to be down here in quadrant four, and it would be bending toward the normal. And that is also borne out by the angle, the 20.3 degrees that we get for theta 2. That's the refracted ray. Now the reflected ray. Well, the reflected ray also has to cross the normal. Please don't draw it down here in quadrant three. It's going to be up here in quadrant one. It will cross the normal, but it has to bounce off the surface so it stays in the same material when you have reflection. So this would be 30 degrees over on this side. All right, two more slides here. What two physics phenomenon are shown below? Well, first off, you may notice that the light is bending. So that would be the slide that we just came off of. Refraction is one of the phenomenon happening. But the more important one here, the very colorful phenomenon, uh, shows that the light colors are separating, meaning the different wavelengths and frequencies are separating. Um, so it's important to remember that violet bends violently, right? Violet's always going to bend the most and red the least. and um, the root word uh, to disperse uh, comes into play here. This is dispersion that we're talking about. D-I-S-P-E-R-S-I-O-N. All right. Last slide. Here we have a light ray traveling from air to water, but it looks like it's being um, shined straight down onto the surface. Now, in terms of refraction, if this was a refraction problem, if we were asked what theta 1 is, it gets a little complicated because it looks like it should be 90 degrees. But remember, all rays need to be measured from the normal. And if you draw the normal perpendicular to the surface where the ray strikes it, you will see that theta 1 is 0 degrees, which means if you run that through Snell's law, you will get a theta 2 of 0 degrees, which means the ray will simply just continue straight. Now, what happens to the speed, the frequency, and the wavelength as we go from air to water? Well, remember, it's always helpful to write down what our indices of refraction are. 1.0 and 
and we don't have to worry about less to more bends toward because it's going straight through, no bend at all this time. You could technically say it's not refracting. And so what happens to these quantities? Well, the easiest one to talk about is the frequency, because you may remember that the frequency of a wave never changes once it leaves the source, so the frequency would stay the same, which is why I've circled it. What happens to the velocity as you go into a more optically dense material, meaning a material with a higher index of refraction? Well, it slows down. That's what n equals c over v is about, or it's described by n equals c over v. Here, the n value is going up, which means down here, since these two are inversely related, uh, v is going to go down. Now, if so velocity goes down, so what's going to happen to the wavelength? Well, the most important equation for that guy is velocity is wavelength times frequency. Since the frequency hasn't changed and the velocity is going down, if your answer is going down, something on the right side better be going down. So wavelength will also go down. It's important to remember that velocity and wavelength always go in the same direction. If one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. One gets smaller, the other gets smaller. And the frequency doesn't change. All right, that's it.